Okay, wow. Critics of Joseph Smith's first vision often point, and they do, to differences in his various accounts as evidence of inconsistency. They highlight discrepancies in details such as Joseph's age at the time of the vision and the number of divine persons he claimed to have seen and his reasons for seeking divine guidance. These critics argue that such variations suggest the story evolved over time rather than being a record of a single actual event. Many of you know this. I've known this for a few years and it didn't bother me, but it did bother a lot of my friends and family. There are five variations that the critics often like to pick apart and say because they were different, you know, um, that it evolved over time. But I like to say that it, it just depends on the audience that you have in front of you. And many others say the same thing. Like you're not going to share uh, what goes on in the temple the same way that you would share with somebody that would ask you uh, off the street. You're going to share it differently than you would with your child that you're going to do, going to uh, chaperone for the first time to get, that they're about to get their endowment, right? You're not going to share the same sacred uh, experiences and feelings with somebody that just asked you off the street, you know, what goes on in your temple? But there's an overlooked text supporting the prophet Joseph Smith's first vision, um, and it shows that it's very consistent. It's showing that this narrative has been with him from the beginning and even before uh, the first account that we have. So check this out. This is huge. Hello, folks. Welcome back to the program. Okay, today I have an interesting article. It's amazing, and it's from the Deseret News. Some of you know what I'm talking about here, and some of you don't. Um, if you weren't already familiar with the first vision, uh, and the, there were many accounts, and there's like five accounts that are very popular, and the, the critics and ex-Latter-day Saints like to point that there is inconsistency in um, the Joseph Smith, uh, how he told it and the many times that he told it and how at different times he told it differently and that there was never uh, a Godhead experience like he told later and that that was added later and that many of the saints didn't know, um, didn't understand a Godhead. Well, they didn't because he didn't speak about it very much because it was sacred. That's not something I learned this from a scholar. That wasn't something that was repeated over and over again by him. We tend to repeat it over and over again, the Joseph Smith story. And it's repeated in the, the front of the book of Mormon, which was added later. But that's why many members of the church from uh, the beginning didn't, uh, didn't speak about this sacred event because it was very sacred. A lot of you know who Don Bradley is and Walker Wright. Well, check this out. Let me read this from uh, Deseret News. Uh, this is entitled, and oh, this was from uh, April 13th, 2024, an overlooked text supporting Joseph Smith's first vision consistency. Uh, what does this mean? A text? What? Joseph Smith wasn't texting, right? Well, let's find out. Joseph Smith's early biblical translation efforts provide overlooked evidence that his view of humankind's ability to see God was consistent. Uh, editor's note, this commentary is part of an ongoing Deseret News series exploring ideas at the intersection of faith and thought. So check that out. With spring now officially here, some Latter-day Saints have no doubt reflected on Joseph Smith's first vision, which took place in the spring of 1820. Been on our minds. Conference was just here. We're thinking about it, right? Smith's first vision is hailed by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the beginning of the restoration of Christ's restored gospel. I don't like how they say Smith's. 
why can't we be a little bit more uh, this is just my opinion be a little bit more proper um, I noticed that um, scholars with it it, it kind of shows a little chippiness on your shoulder um, I I know that critics say it a lot let's let's stand out from that that would be my charge to those who write these things by members of the church as the beginning of the restoration of Christ's restored gospel, which was 1830. Like differences between the New Testament gospel accounts, scholars have likewise had questions about the differences in the availability accounts of the first vision. The multiple accounts of the first vision vary in detail uh, with Joseph Smith's earliest written account, 1832. I there's a really neat video if you can find it on YouTube. I'm going to find it and leave the link. I know I always say that and then I forget, but it's um, Truman G. Madsen. He loved the prophet and he, uh, he talks about those five different accounts. It's been said that they lack some elements found in his later accounts from 1832. Most notably, this account refers to Joseph seeing the Lord jesus christ without specifying that he also encountered god the father and in a second i'll tell you what um what i've heard from many that made sense to me a lot of you don't know that there has been many accounts but think about it when you're living <clears throat> as many years as joseph did since the time he was 14 and from the time that you had that most amazing um, event happened in your life. Depending on the audience, think about something that was sacred to you. When depending on the audience, do you talk about details that go on in the temple? And I'm not talking about de details that you can't talk about. I'm talking about details you can. Uh, it goes to the cast your pearls before swine effect, right? Or analogy and metaphor. When if I'm Talking to somebody that just haphazardly on the street goes, so what goes on in your temple? I'm not going to get into the types and shadows unless the Holy Ghost talks to me about it. And, and then I, unless the spirit is there. Satan rides a lawnmower. Every time it doesn't. So I'm sorry if you hear the lawnmower. Nothing I can do about it. You, you get my drift. And, but if you're sitting down with somebody that's getting ready to go through the temple they're having anxiety. They're unsure of what they want to do. And you start breaking down some of the meaning that you're allowed to before they go. And, and look, for instance, temple preparation classes will be different from those if you are just haphazardly. Or, or if somebody is just haphazardly asking you tritely what goes on in your temples, but you want to come back with a good answer, right? It's going to be different. And the same with Joseph Smith. So uh, this led some critics to allege the inclusion of God the Father, that it was manufactured because it was left out before. However, new findings indicate that the presence of God the Father in the, in the first vision was already established in 1832 to 1833. Amazing. Uh, in a recent issue of BYU Studies, we contribute... Uh, to the growing body of work on the first vision and present the evidence for the father's inclusion in the first accounts of the first vision. Lawnmowers. You could probably hear it. So anyway, <laughs> nothing I can do about it. And then it gets louder again. These are obstacles. Satan doesn't want me to talk about this. I mean, it's huge, right? Yeah. Lawnmowers. Maybe you can't even hear it. Okay. So although the 1832 account does lack some elements found in later accounts, a number of these same elements can be found throughout Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible. Uh, Joseph Smith's translation of Psalm 14, for instance, includes a search for a correct view of the divine. Seek ye among the children of men to see if there are any that do understand God. The condemnation of corrupt uh, the condemnation of corrupt preachers, workers of iniquity, and anticipation of the restoration of the church, Zion. O oh Lord, when wilt thou establish Zion? Sometime between July 1832 and July 1833, Joseph Smith completed 
this inspired Bible revision. It was during this period that he recorded both his 1832 account of the first vision, July uh, through September 1832, and two specific passages in the New Testament. In, it, in its King James Version form, John 1.18 reads, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Smith's revision found in the JST manuscript, Joseph Smith translation, adds a condition on which the Father can be seen. Quote, And no man has seen God at any time, except he hath borne record of the Son, for except it is through him, no man can be saved, close quote. In Smith's rendition, in, Joseph, in the prophet Joseph Smith's rendition, God the Father can be seen with the proviso, with the proviso, let me, proviso. Provisone, you want some uh, proviso with the, your uh, ravioli. In Smith's rendition, God the Father can be seen with the proviso, that he always bears record of the son to those privileged to see him. This is as Smith would describe it in later first vision accounts. I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name and said, pointing to the other, this is my beloved son. Hear him. In, a, in an exact echo of John 1.18, the King James Version of 1 John 4.12 reads, No man has seen God at any time. Joseph Smith again qualifies this with a proviso in his translation. And yes, I did look up proviso because at first there was a the proviso. Okay, in his translation, except them who believe. In both alterations made several months before Joseph Smith's earliest recorded account of the first vision in 1832, God the Father is made visible. And in each alteration, a condition is presented on which the Father can be seen, a condition met by Joseph Smith in his own first vision account. Before he saw the Father, he exercised faith and became one of them who believe, meeting the condition specified in Joseph Smith translation, 1 John 4.12. He also heard the Father bear record of the Son, meeting the condition specified in in the Joseph Smith translation, John 1.18. Given Joseph Smith's changes to these passages, in each case, qualifying the apparent absoluteness of the statement, quote, no man has seen God, close quote, it is intriguing that he imports this very phrase into the beginning of his revised Psalm 14, which states, the fool has said in his heart, there is no man that has seen God, because he showeth himself not unto us, therefore there is no God. Having revised the two New Testament passages to stipulate conditions on which human beings can be seen, can see God the Father, the fool who denies God in Psalm 14.1 now becomes one who denies any possibility of, the, of theophany. Come on, Don Bradley. We know you're smart, but you don't need to say theophany. Appearance of God. You could have probably just said appearance of God. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We love you. This would include the preacher who treated Joseph's own theophany, the appearance of God, with great contempt, saying it was all of the devil, that there were no such things as visions or revelations in these days. Joseph Smith's revisions to the Bible discussed here provide evidence that these supposedly late developments, developed elements of the first vision may actually predate even the earliest first vision account. Wow. Amazing. Already by 1831 to 32, Joseph Smith's translation of John 118 and John 1 John 412 intimates that he connected his first vision with the idea of seeing God the Father and of God the Father bearing witness of the Son. He did it. He experienced that, brothers and sisters, and there's evidence here 
Thank you so much, Don Bradley. I don't know the other guy, but Don Bradley, but I should probably find out who the other guy is, intimates that he connected his first vision with the idea of seeing God the Father and of his son, Jesus Christ, bearing witness of the son. In his 1833 translation of Psalm 14, Joseph's translation likewise echoes the first vision, reinforcing that God the Father was part of the, the, of the vision and weaving in further elements that will not appear in his own formal accounts for several years but did not mean it was sacred brothers and sisters he that's something that people needed to gain people well people needed to gain a testimony through the the holy ghost not him constantly sharing that over and over again he knew it would get out it would come forth but that wasn't what was going to convert people that's where the critics miss the point of the spirit. And if they read and study the New Testament, not even the Book of Mormon, the New Testament, constantly the apostles are telling people that the members, that things are, you, you're converted by the Holy Ghost, you're converted by the spirit, not by what I, not by his miracles, not by following him around and, and, and you know, watching his healings, raising people from the dead. He looks at Peter. He says, no man, who, who, do, who dost thou say I am? He says, thou art uh, uh, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, no man has told you this except my father in heaven, which he's told him by the Holy Ghost. Joseph's translation likewise echoes the first vision, reinforcing that God the Father was part of the vision and weaving in further elements that will not appear in his own formal accounts for several years. Thus, Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible is yet one more element suggesting Joseph Smith was consistent in attesting to the nature of the first vision events from the beginning of his prophetic career. Don Bradley is an independent historian and the author of The Lost 116 Pages, Reconstructing the Book of Mormon's Missing Stories. Uh, Walker Wright works for a public policy think tank in Washington, D.C., and is published on economic theology and, and politics. Isn't that amazing, brothers and sisters? So what does that tell you? That tells you that, like other things that, have, that the critics have gotten wrong, and I'm not trying to, uh, this is not an attack on anyone that tries to disprove it. It's, it's a celebration of one more thing. But this, once again, is not the way you find truth or that you know that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. I didn't know any of these things when I was 12 years old. I can't remember if it was 12, 13, or 14. It was like in between those years. I went to a bat. Maybe it was 13. But I, I told you the story. How I've been, I was reading the Book of Mormon, prayed about it, went to a baptism, felt the Holy Ghost from head to toe. I felt like it was something even greater than the Holy Ghost, like the Savior was with me. Either way, brothers and sisters, that's how you gain uh, a knowledge of these things.